Who should be our ultimate authority when it comes to religious matters? Well, friends, Jesus tells us. Notice what he says, sanctify them by your truth. And what does he say next? Your word is truth. Friends, if you want to find the truth in spiritual matters, in religious matters, this is the place to go. This is the place to go. Because you see, the Bible contains eternal, unchanging truths. And friends, by studying God's word, religious myths that have been believed for centuries will be revealed. The Bible alone is our guide, our safe guide in religious matters, in spiritual matters. The Bible and the Bible only is the sole stand that a Christian can take in matters of doctrine and belief. Now, friends, we have seen how the great thought makers have captured the minds and allegiance of the masses with their ideas, with their philosophies, with their concepts. And we've seen how Charles Darwin introduced the concept of evolution and persuaded people into believing that they have evolved over billions of years due to chaos and chance. And friends, Satan has used the theory of evolution to attack God and his position as creator. But God has an answer to this devastating attack. God has an answer to the theory of evolution. God has a memorial, the Sabbath day which he gave people as a reminder that he is the creator. Now, friends, let me just stop here for a moment. What does that remind you of? Apple Macintosh. What does this remind you of? Mercedes Benz. Oh, I wish I had one. (laughs) Mercedes Benz. What does this remind you of? Shell Petroleum, oil, that's it. What about Nike? All of these symbols mean something, don't they? You see, friends, symbols are used to express meaning, to represent identity, to declare power and authority. They represent concepts and ideas, do they not? Take a look at this. And this, and this, you see friends, you can take some blue cloth, some white cloth, and some red cloth that is absolutely meaningless, isn't that right? But you cut it and you sew it together in such a way that all of a sudden it takes on meaning. Isn't that right? Do you know that people have died for that? For that flag? Because it symbolizes something. It means something. And friends, you can take the same red, white, and blue material and you can put a different design to it and Americans would die for that flag. And you can do the same with red, white, and blue cloth. Design it in another way. And French people have died for that flag. God took an ordinary day. Just as we take ordinary cloth, blue, white, and red, and make a flag. God took an ordinary day, time. You can count the hours in it. In that respect, it's no different from any other day. But then he made a Sabbath out of it, the Sabbath out of it. He made it stand for something. He made it represent something. The Sabbath is God's sign. It's his symbol. And Jesus tells us that the Sabbath is his day, the Lord's day. (laughs) 
I'm going to share something with you this evening that I share in love from my heart. So I want you to know that I don't wish to offend anyone this evening. I simply want to share with you the truth of God. Because I think, friends, it's important for us to know somewhere has changed the Sabbath. Now, friends, what do all heathen religions have in common? Everyone, without exception, sun worship. And Satan's goal is to subtly and deceitfully infiltrate and contaminate true religion with the elements of paganism. And in this way, he corrupts true religion with a subtle mix, a very subtle mix of, of truth and error that leads people into his empire. The roots of sun worship can be traced all the way back to the time of Noah. Noah's great-grandson was Nimrod. Listen to what the Bible says about Nimrod. Nimrod grew to be a mighty warrior on the earth. Beginning with the Tower of Babel, Nimrod's achievements adorn the records and legends of ancient history. But Nimrod was evil. And he became a leader of false worship. Notice what the Bible says. The first centers of the kingdom were Babylon, Rech, Akkad, and Kel Kelna in Shinar. And then you notice it mentions Babylon. Babylon became the great founding center of sun worship. At Babylon, Lucifer, working through Nimrod, established a center from which to expand his empire based on the worship of the sun. Let me read to you from the historians. Jaquita Hawks, Man and the Sun. Sun worship became immensely widespread. There is hardly a region in the world that did not know it at some time and in some form. And you know, friends, you can go and visit all the great monuments of the ancient world, from the pyramids of Egypt to the great carved buildings in Petra. You can go and visit all these great monuments that the ancient civilizations built. Machu Picchu. You can go to Chichen Itza. You can go to the largest pyramids in the world found in Mexico. You can go to Stonehenge. What do all these sacred sites have in common? They were all great centers of sun worship. Virtually all ancient civilizations were involved in some form of sun worship. It all began here in Babylon. Babylon was the great founding center of sun worship. From Babylon, sun worship spread to infect the world. Now you remember, Babylon fell to Cyrus the Great, the Persian leader. The Persians overthrew Babylon, and they embraced the religion of ancient Babylon. And through the Persian world, through their empire, sun worship continued to spread. Who overthrew the Persians? The Greeks, Alexander the Great. The Greeks under Alexander conquered the Persians, and they ruled the world. And they embraced the sun worship from the Persians, who had got it from the Babylonians. And so, friends, sun worship continued to spread throughout the Greek Empire. And then along came mighty Rome, the Caesars. And the Romans continued the practice of sun worship that had its origins back in Babylon, from Babylon to Medo-Persia to Greece and now into the very heart of Rome. And so Rome became the new center of sun worship. And it spread very quickly throughout the empire. 
They named it the days of the week after the planets, the stars. Sunday after the sun, Monday after the moon, Tuesday Mars, Wednesday Mercury, Thursday Jupiter, Friday Venus, Saturday Saturn. And my friends, just as the sun rules over the planets, Sunday rose to honor above the other days of the week. The pagans worship the sun on the sun's day, Sunday. And in the great temples of Rome, the sun worship of ancient Babylon took center stage. The names of the gods changed with culture, but the central religion was Babylonian sun worship. Traveled through all the great empires. Now the question is this, how did sun worship, pagan sun worship, affect the Christian church? The Apostle Paul clearly warned that Bible truth would be undermined by paganism. The Apostles warned that subversive changes would come that were contrary to God's commandments. Listen to what they said. Here's their warning. There will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, and many will follow their destructive ways. Notice again here. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come, in a, will come among you, not sparing the flock. Again, also from yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. Now, friends, the apostles and the first Christians, the first generation of Christians, were first fiercely loyal to Jesus Christ and the teachings of the Bible. They refused to have any part of sun worship. They refused any compromise with paganism. The early Christians would rather die than compromise Bible truth. And so many thousands, were martyred for their faith. The early church stood firm against paganism. But my friends, as the years went by, and the first generations of Christians passed off the scene, the church began to wonder. It drifted from the original teachings of Jesus. And rites and ceremonies, dates, teachings of which the apostles had never heard began to creep into the church. In an effort to gain popularity, the church began to compromise. And gradually it welcomed customs and holy days from the ancient Babylonian system of religion. And so quietly and gradually, the symbols, the days, the rites and ceremonies of Babylonian paganism spread into the church. And then in the fourth century, Emperor Constantine tried to hold his empire together, the Roman Empire, by uniting pagans and Christians into one of the great systems of religion. One great system of religion. And my friends, as a direct result, Christianity was corrupted. Let me read to you from the historians. The Christians were as far as thinking and habits went, the same old pagans. They flocked into the church, friends, and they brought their paganism with them. Their surge into the churches did not wipe out paganism. On the contrary, hordes of baptized pagans meant that paganism had diluted the moral energies of organized Christianity to the point of impotence. Here's another historian. It, is, it was a definite Christian policy to take over the pagan festivals endeared to the people by tradition and give them a Christian significance. Another historian. The forms and ceremonies of paganism gradually crept into the worship. Some of the old heathen feasts became church festivals with change of name and worship. Now you might be saying today, come on Gary, that would never happen in our day and age. 
Where is the evidence of paganism in our Christianity today? Well, friends, let me ask you this question. Have you ever wondered where chocolate eggs and bunny rabbits come from and what they have to do with the resurrection of Christ? They are fertility symbols directly from the pagan religion of ancient Babylon. That's where they come from, friends. Look, read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. You'll find nothing about chocolate bunny rabbits and eggs and so forth. You see, Ishtar was the great Babylonian virgin goddess, also called the Queen of Heaven. Does that ring a bell? The Queen of Heaven. Ishtar gave birth to Tammuz, and the Babylonians celebrated his birthday at the time of the winter solstice. Follow me, friends. Track with me. The Persians adopted Tammuz as Mithra, the Romans as Saturn. They celebrated the pagan god's birthday on the 25th of December. Now you might say, that is just going too far. Listen, friends, let me read to you from the Encyclopedia Britannica. 25th of December, the birthday of who? Mithra, the invincible sun, as well as the day Saturnalia, was adopted by the church as Christmas, the nativity of Christ. Christmas entered the church directly from paganism and sun worship. And since no one knew the exact date of Christ's birth, Christians took the birth of the sun god that was celebrated by pagan sun worshippers. Now, the Babylonian male fertility god, Tammuz, died every winter. And he had to be resurrected to bring plants and animals and people to give them life. To celebrate the resurrection of Tammuz, they made cakes with a T on them for Tammuz. That's the origin of our hot cross buns. You won't read about them in the Bible, friends. That's where it comes from. In the Babylonian scheme of things in their religion, the resurrection of Tammuz was celebrated each year about the time of the spring equinox. Are you familiar with the resurrection festival on the first day of the week after the first full moon following the northern equinox? We call it Easter, named after the Babylonian goddess Ustra. The Anglo-Saxon equivalent, well, the Babylonian is Ishtar, the Anglo-Saxon is Ustra. That's where Easter comes from. The pagans celebrated the rebirth of their gods with fertility rituals and celebrations using the symbol of eggs and rabbits. Symbols of fertility associated with sun worship. And my friends, when Christianity swept through Europe and tried to convert pagans to Christianity, they adopted many of the pagan holy days in order to make it easier for pagans to convert. They just took the pagan holy days and gave them a different name, but kept their pagan traditions and symbols. Oh, my friends, many Christian symbols and festivals today come to us from ancient Babylon. In fact, the most holy days in the Christian calendar all have their origins in paganism. Christmas, Easter, Sunday worship. That's where they originated from. Sadly, many Christian holy day symbols, traditions and customs have pagan DNA. Friends, there's no secret. Let me read to you from, from Cardinal John Henry Newman. 
He says, the use of temples and candles, holy water, holy days and seasons are all of pagan origin and sanctified by their adoption to the church. Let me read further. The church made a sacred day of Sunday, largely because it was the weekly festival of the sun, for it was a definite Christian policy to take over the pagan festivals endeared to the people by tradition and to give them a Christian significance. My friends, in the year AD 321, The Roman Emperor Constantine decreed Sunday, the ancient pagan holiday devoted to the worship of the sun, should be observed by everyone, all in his empire. And then 43 years later, in AD 364, the church at the Council of Laodicea followed Emperor Constantine and decreed that Christians should worship on Sunday instead of the Sabbath. The seventh-day Sabbath was solemnized by Christ, the apostles, and, prim and the primitive Christians till the, the Laodicean council did in a manner quite abolish the observance of it all. The council of Laodicea, 364 AD, first settled the observance of the Lord's Day on Sunday. I'm going to read to you from the catechisms. Question, which day is the Sabbath. Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. That's from the Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine. Let me read to you from the Catholic Press of Sydney. Sunday is a Catholic institution, and its claim to observance can be defended only on Catholic principles. From beginning to end of Scripture, there is not a single passage that warrants the transfer of weekly public worship from the last day of the week to the first. Now let me read to you from Jesus. Why do you transgress the commandment of God? Because of your tradition. Friends, you and I are in the midst of a cosmic conflict. A great controversy between God's empire and Satan's empire. God's empire is built on the law of love, Satan's on lawlessness. God's on obedience, Satan's on disobedience. God's empire is built on his right to rule because he is the creator. Satan is a creature, a created being. God chose as his symbol the Sabbath. Satan chose as his symbol the sun. And friends, God is calling us today to stop trampling his law underfoot, walking on the symbol that represents him as our creator. He calls on us to remember the Sabbath day because that's how we remember that he is our creator, the one who made us. Friends, we live in an age when the world has been deceived by the rebel angel, deceived into believing that you and I are only here because of billions of years of chance and chaos. At this point in time, when Satan's great deception is wooing the world, God sends a message to his people, calling them out of Babylon and back to true worship. Aristotle studied spiders, and he classified the spider as having six legs, and because the great Aristotle taught it, no one even bothered to count and check. Well, friends, that might be okay in biology, but it's not okay when it comes to spiritual matters and your eternal destiny and mine. You and I are living on the verge of eternity. 
Jesus is coming soon. And friends, this battle between good and evil, between God and Satan, between God's empire and Satan's empire is heating up. It's drawing to a conclusion. Jesus, the creator, is coming soon. He's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And he invites you and me to be citizens in that kingdom because he loves us. He's given everything to make it possible for you and me to be there. He died on Calvary's cross, suffered and died. The creator himself dying for his creatures. He died to pay the penalties of your mistakes and mine. And friends, it doesn't matter what mistakes you've made. Jesus died for those sins. He's paid the penalty. He's done everything possible to have you live with him forever. That's why he's coming back. It is my prayer that every one of us will be found ready and waiting to meet Jesus when he comes. Let us make a commitment that we're going to be loyal to him, that we're going to be faithful to him, that we will not be deceived by his arch enemy, Lucifer, the fallen angel. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, the Bible, the foundation of all truth. Father, we live in a serious and critical time of this earth's history. The great conflict, the controversy between God and Satan is coming to a crescendo, coming to a climax. And Jesus is coming soon. And Father, we want to be ready to meet Jesus when he comes. Grant each of us that privilege, dear Lord, I pray. I ask your blessing upon every head bowed before you this evening. Lord, you know us by name. Please write our names in the Lamb's book of life. Prepare a mansion for us in your kingdom. And Lord, keep us faithful and true until Jesus comes. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.